Um, so, Colleen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. And um, thanks to Christoph and Susie and everybody for organizing this, this conference. So, um, my paper is about mindfulness and the phenomenology of aesthetics, and I'll be reappraising um, Mikhail Dufresne and Merleau Ponty. Phenomenological approaches to philosophy mirror mindful approaches to the world with emphasis on lived experience and perception. This is never more evident than in the phenomenology of aesthetics. When aesthetic experience is understood through the lens of phenomenology, it echoes mindfulness practice. Both Merleau-Ponty and Dufresne unwittingly describe how mindfulness theory meets phenomenology at the juncture of perception. The following paper will begin with an examination of the relevant aspects of the philosophy of phenomenologists Merleau-Ponty and Dufresne respectively before discussing the cognitive structure of mindfulness and highlighting how the phenomenology of aesthetic experience corresponds to it. These philosophers do not refer directly to a mindful attitude, but their emphasis on the significance of lived experience of aesthetic engagement point to the possibility that the creation and appreciation of art, particularly painting in this context, are mindfulness-based interventions. So first I'll begin with Merleau-Ponty. Merleau-Ponty maintained that painting is an access to being. It achieves this not through vision, but heightened vision. And I quote from Merleau-Ponty, it gives visible extension to what profane vision believes to be invisible. The, the painter brings our awareness to actually seeing the world. For what we see is always incomplete. The painter earns the gift of seeing through continuous practice. And this cannot be done in isolation, but by going out into the world. Clay's experience signified this for Merleau-Ponty when he declared that he felt that the trees were looking at him and speaking to him. He is not describing a mystical experience. This is a practical aspect of the work of painting, as can be understood in Clay's statement. I think the painter must be penetrated by the universe. The notion of heightened vision is a central aspect of Merleau-Ponty's theory of painting because it introduces his contention that painting makes visible what is invisible. But what exactly does this mean and how does it relate to mindfulness? Merleau-Ponty tells us that painting gives visible extension to what profane vision believes to be invisible. He goes on to say that the painter brings our awareness to actually seeing the world. Providing a painting provides a pause and points to the visual world to aspects that are there, only we did not notice. Them. Otherwise, we exist in a constricted state entering into a more expanded state where we can actually see more and hence experience more provides for the opportunity for greater consciousness. Therefore, being becomes more authentic because we can begin to engage with what else is really there. And this is not a luxury, but a necessity to a fully lived life. The painter extracts what seems to be invisible by going out into the world and not just looking, but participating. This is why Clay said that the trees were talking to him. He was a participant in their world. It is as Gallen Johnson describes how phenomena phenomenology and painting exhibit, quote, the same kind of attentiveness and wonder, the same demand for awareness. Merleau-Ponty was particularly impressed with Cezanne's paintings. He claimed that Cezanne wished to return to the things themselves. Cezanne stated that we exist through nature and that nature is on the inside. Cezanne would say, quote, the landscape thinks itself through me and I am its consciousness. For Merleau-Ponty, Cezanne made visible how the world touches us. The viewer who chooses to pause at a painting and look at what has been set aside for contemplation will also witness the normally hidden aspects of life. In this respect, the painting, the painting is a shared experience. For how often do people ignore the sunset until presented with a painting of the sunset? which calls to mind the actual sunset, and the next time the sun sets, they look more closely and they engage. And in this way, an image can reveal the world to us and awaken powers of dormant vision. So quote from Merleau-Ponty on that point, painting thrusts us again into the presence of the world of lived experience. In the work of Cezanne, Juan Gris, Braque and Picasso, in different ways, we encounter different objects, lemons, mandolins, bunches of grapes, pouches of tobacco that do, that do not pass quickly before our eyes in the guise of objects we know well, but on the contrary, hold our gaze and ask questions of it. Because paintings show the world in a different way 
they sort of stimulate our sense of perception rather than just going through the motions in life. Dufresne reiterates this point made by Merleau-Ponty. Quote, we believe that art repeats what we have seen because we can identify what art represents. But in fact, we have not seen any of these things before. We had not yet seen the writhing power of the human torso before seeing Mike Michelangelo's slaves or the tortured form of the iris before seeing Van Gogh's bouquet. We could almost say that perception begins with art, unquote. According to Dufresne, the aesthetic object possesses, possesses a depth with, which roots us from our comfort zone in order to bring us face to face with a new world, which demands a new outlook. Art shows us things we have not seen before because it opens up not just the world, but what feels like new worlds, because our sense perception is sharpened by the experience of engagement. Similarly, mindfulness opens powers of perception and subsequently we can engage and participate in the world rather than simply pass through it. Dufresne's phenomenology of aesthetic experience is very much about being present, focused and non-judgmental. These dis dispositions also characterize the mindful attitude. Dufresne's repeated references to being, not doing, attention and being present to the aesthetic object in order to realize its signification hearken Eastern philosophy and psychological theories of mindfulness. Like Merleau-Ponty, Dufresne begins with the moment of perception. The perceiver is a witness to the artwork. For Dufresne, this witness penetrates the work, world of the work through a connivance. In this respect, we see that although the person is an observer, she, he is also engaged through a communication which occurs through, quote, solitary and meditative consciousness for the sake of its metamorphosis into an aesthetic object, unquote. Hence, the perceiver must be simultaneously inside and outside the work. In order to do this, she, he must adopt the attitude of a witness who is at one with the perception and, quote, who is an accomplice rather than a judge. According to Dufresne, this is achieved through the body being wholly present to the work of art through a corporeal complicity. Equally, there should be no excessive striving on the part of the artist. Dufresne argues that for the artist, being and doing are the same thing. The spectator is invited to be, not do. Nonetheless, Dufresne makes reference to participation, which suggests active involvement. He says, we have insisted that perception is a task. This requires skill. The skills necessary are the ability to focus and give one's undivided attention to the aesthetic object. This is the means to opening oneself up to the world. Quote, I came to open myself up to the world of the work to be present, to experience an apotheosis of the present. Unquote. Dufresne goes on to say that the work of art is an education in attention and that a process of training is required in order to cleanse one's mind by eliminating every prejudice. This results in being sensitized to the work of art and it demands effort. Although aesthetic participation appreciation begins with feeling, it must be combined with reflection to bring us into the presence of knowledge. The artwork must stimulate the mind as well. Furthermore, the observer is not solitary, but part of a public. Aesthetic contemplation is a social act where individuals feel themselves to be interdependent. Dufresne asserts that the most authentic subjectivity is that which rejoins the universal. For Dufresne, humanity is never totally transparent to itself, and he states that men are continually blind to some aspect of men. Following from this, it is clear that something needs to be uncovered, or as Dufresne puts it, discovered in order to reveal truth. So just a closer look at mindfulness and phenomenology. Um, together before going back to Dufresne and Merleau-Ponty. In mindfulness-based interventions, the mind is trained to be anchored in the present moment. One of the ways in which mindfulness training works is to reduce habitual patterns of responding. Individuals have, who have cultivated this approach to experience exhibit increased flexibility, fluency, and originality in responses. This results in a mind which perceives more clearly and the individual sees him or herself as an integral part of the world rather than apart from the world and experiencing alienation. In systematic reviews of neuropsychological findings, researchers find that mindfulness training improves cognitive abilities, including attention and memory. So we might all know this, but the reason for mentioning this is just to show the connection between art and mindfulness because mindfulness is also above all about perceptual awareness. And this is why it relates to the phenomenological theories of aesthetics. 
High mindful individuals have been characterized as more attuned to sensations and perceptions. These individuals demonstrate superior perceptual abilities in visual work, memory, and temporal tasks. Mindfulness has its roots in Buddhist practices and philosophy. Through meditation practice, the Buddhist practitioner learns to control attention to greater extents and to better perceive events as they occur. This is due to seeing life for what it really is and accepting it. A veil of obscurity is apparently lifted and truth is revealed. This unveiling, which is thought to come about, brings us to our first point of commonality between mindfulness and aesthetics. It corresponds to Merleau-Ponty's notion that perception is always incomplete. For Merleau-Ponty, painting helps to bridge the gap between the invisible and the visible, and perception becomes more complete. Similarly, Dufresne asserted that the truth remained to be uncovered, and this can be achieved through the aesthetic experience. For Dufresne, aesthetic objects reveal worlds by liberating dormant emotions. According to Dreyfus, in traditional Buddhism, mindfulness is, re is related to the reduction of suffering because suffering comes from the fundamental problem of the mistaken interpretation of reality. Quote, the world is given to us through our senses, but rather than stick to what we experience from moment to moment, we remain prisoner of our constructions. Buddhism recommends that we stop living in this self-centered universe and start living in the real world of momentary experience. Otherwise, the mind is a prisoner of unbridled discursivity. What is shared by all these theories is that the world remains to be uncovered in order to fully engage with life. And there are methods and interventions which facilitate this process. According to Goldstein, bare attention, which is constitutive of mindfulness practice, is observing without evaluating single-minded insight at successive moments of perception. This is conducive to the uncovering of truth. This description could equally apply to aesthetic experience when it is understood phenomenologically. Kabat-Zinn describes mindfulness as paying attention to present perceptions and experience in a non-judgmental and non-reactive manner. This entails controlling the attention in a purposeful way in the context of open-minded acceptance. We know that Dufresne considered aesthetic experience to be an education in attention and recommended that the mind undergo training in order to be up for the task. The goal of mindfulness-based interventions is to improve the individual's abilities to observe what is occurring while it is occurring. This results in a mind that is more perceptually observant. Sense perception is at the center of both Merleau-Ponty's and Dufresne's theories of aesthetics. Dufresne in particular uses the words being present and being a witness in a non-judgmental way. Merleau-Ponty spoke specifically about visual perception and the benefit of heightened visual perception, which is one aspect of mindful perception. So when Merleau-Ponty said that Cezanne made visible how the world touches us, in effect, he was saying that Cezanne makes us more visually mindful of the world. It should be noted that in mindfulness meditation practice, it is said that there are no actions to perform. However, the person is actively engaged in the practice. This directly echoes Dufresne's numerous assertions that aesthetic appreciation should involve being and not doing, although there is work involved in proper appreciation. <coughs> it is a task, almost a practice, like other forms of mindfulness-based interventions. Can I just take a drink? <coughs> Similarly, for the artist, being and doing are one. For Merleau-Ponty, the process of being opened up to the world and therefore truth is existential and organic. As Albert Hubbard said, art is a thing, not a way, which could equally apply to mindfulness practice. Dreyfus reminds us that the central feature of mindfulness is to hold an object with sustained attention. His ultimate argument is that this temporal aspect accounts for the cognitive significance of mind mindfulness as it is crucially connected to memory. In this regard, Dreyfus points out that when we are presented with an object, we integrate it within a temporal flow so that it is given to us as making sense. This temporal aspect of mindfulness is echoed in phenomenological theories of aesthetics. For example, Dufresne asserts that aesthetic experience involves not just feeling, but also subsequent reflective ability of the mind to make sense of the affected experience. Dufresne states that no one really comes to grips with feeling who has not undergone the experience of reflection. The work of art provokes the intelligence as well, according to Dufresne, and this process has a chronology. The shared belief in universality is another common feature. Right mindfulness, as it is termed, 
has implications for ethics, awareness of others, and of being, being of service in the world. Merleau-Ponty and Dufresne both include a dimension of universality and concept of the other. Merleau-Ponty has written at length on the other being a mirror reflection of the self. In this regard, reciprocity is an indispensable consideration in his philosophy. And equally, Dufresne champions the universal, whereby each individual is a delegate of humanity. The relationship between subject and object is not a private one. The observer is not solitary, but part of the public. Elemental to this notion is the supposition that the singular is present with the universal. The spectator is part of a cultural milieu and the public forms a real community. Finally, perceptual attention to the present moment as it is occurring through embodiment is at the center of both mindfulness and the aesthetic theories discussed. So in conclusion, I would say that mindfulness practice and the phenomenology of aesthetic experience do not correlate directly. Mindfulness practice recommends focused attention where possible to any and all aspects of the world. In contrast, the aesthetic object is the unique focal point for contemplation and the object of use is disregarded. With regard to painting, visual mindfulness is the main focus. And what of the ultimate goal of both of these interventions? In Buddhism, mindfulness is not an end in itself. It is a goal to end suffering, as we know. Happiness can only come about when perception is cleansed of its misconceptions. So is this where aesthetics and mindfulness part ways? Well, not necessarily. For Dufresne, being present to the aesthetic object is also not an end in itself. The state activates the effective a priori, in other words, categories of emotional feeling, which were dormant, are now liberated through the aesthetic experience. This expands our being and engagement with ourselves in the world. Now, Dufresne does not mention the elimination of suffering, but presumably liberation of emotional categories is of benefit to the, self, to the development of self-consciousness and therefore well-being. Merleau-Ponty similarly regards the ultimate significance of painting as opening us up to the world, living in a reciprocal nature with others and the environment. Hence, we live more fully engaged lives with one another and ourselves. Surely this would also reduce suffering and increase satisfaction. Phenomenology and Buddhist philosophy have a shared heritage. Philosophers such as Merleau-Ponty and Dufresne were reacting against Cartesian dualism and science, which celebrated rationality and observable experience. Consider this statement from mindfulness practitioner Dreyfus. Western medical and psychological science has historically emphasized intellectual knowledge and concrete experience as the mainstream of human knowledge. The concept of mindfulness derives from a culture that places higher emphasis upon subjective experience as a source of inquiry and understanding. According to phenomenological thought, Aesthetic experience is by nature, its nature a mindfulness-based intervention, and when practiced through creation or appreciation, sharpens perceptual skills and brings greater awareness of the environment, others, and ultimately ourselves. Viewing a painting provides opportunities to engage with the perspective of others. And as Merleau-Ponty states, culture allows us to dwell in the lives of others. And Dufresne reminds us, reminds us that this is our life also. Thank you. Very good. Hey, Max, do you have a PowerPoint? Uh, uh, no, I don't. I was just going to read it as I am. Okay, you can go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me at this gathering. Uh, my paper will concern the work of the French phenomenologist Michel Henri and the Austrian psychoanalyst Otto Rank. Okay, so through a study of Henri and Rank, uh, this paper endeavors to clarify the role of mindfulness in the flourishing of human life. Okay, I argue that the respective projects of Henri and Rank not only reveal that mindfulness can play an important role in the development of a creative personality that is essential to the flourishing of human life, but their accounts of this matter would benefit from entering into something of a productive dialogue with one another. 
Okay, so in the opening section of this paper, I will lay out Henri's account of the role of creativity in human flourishing and the contribution that mindfulness can make towards the latter. Okay, so following then a critical examination of Henri's analysis of this matter, I will turn to the work of Rank and show how his own work and that of Henri can mutually supplement one another and thereby leave us with a clearer and more accurate understanding of the role of creativity and mindfulness in the health and well being of human beings and potentially society as a whole. All right, so the claim here will be that Henri's material phenomenology and ranks psychoanalytic theory and existential psychotherapy can engage in a, a constructive dialogue, okay, on these matters. All right, so first, I'll get into Henri's theory of life, all right? Henri describes life as the first person self-experience of a radically imminent, unconscious, non-intentional, and non-objectifying movement that comes into and affects itself as the flesh of the living subject and which thereby gives the subject all of her abilities. It is this primal self-affection of life as an autonomous power that takes hold of itself that allows consciousness to give itself to itself. Thus, it is only the radically imminent and effective appearing of life that allows us to well and truly account for how intentional consciousness is able to transcend itself and relate to something else. On this account of Henri's, the subject thus takes on newfound depths. The subject in her attentional faculties lives through a life that she is not, in which she cannot fully seize upon. The imminent appearing of life in its autonomous power enjoys an ontological priority over the ecstatic appearing of the world. Okay, and the relation between the two is, is one of dependence on Henri's account, such that the latter is relative to the former. In its self-sufficiency, life appears in a duplicitous or two-sided manner. On the one hand, as it really is in itself, in its radically imminent self-embrace, and in the world as the transcendence of intentional display. Since life in its radical imminence gives rise to the ecstatic appearing of the world, yet can never appear in the light of the world to which it gives rise, Henri describes life as a radically invisible mode of appearing and the world's visible display as altogether unreal. The life of the living subject is revealed in its reality within our flesh, and it is disseminated in an unreal manner in the transcendent images of the world. And in his own study of the primal self-presencing of life, one of Henri's most important insights, it seems to me, is that the non-objectifying self-sensing of life functions as an autonomous, creative movement that stands outside the power of consciousness and which enjoys an absolute priority over the objectifying acts of the latter. Henri regards the creative movement of life as essentially driven by a need for self-growth. Life, as Henri has it, is essentially need. This need endows the life of each individual with a burdensome weight and an ever-mounting energy that it will need to deploy, not so as to decrease it, but so as to give it free reign. By continuously coming into itself, the life of the living subject does just this by producing its own content independently of intentional consciousness. Outside the power of consciousness, life continuously brings into being what has not yet taken place in being. Hitherto inexperienced tones, impressions, emotions, feelings, and forces that lie outside the realm of consciousness. This generative movement of life as the absolute foundation of being functions as a creative unconscious, or as Henri himself puts it, as a transcendental imagination. Traditionally, the imagination is the faculty of representing a thing in its absence. However, on this account, the imagination does not merely consist in the power to form images, but in the proper history of our bodily subjectivity, in the expansion of its pathos, the movement by which each tone awakens another tone, and then another within itself. Consequently, the projects, the products, of the imagination are not strictly speaking imaginary, 
They consist in the very real affective tonalities that are engendered within our flesh. As Henri writes, quote, the imagination is indeed creative, even in a radical sense that gives it a positivity that it was not glimpsed by classical thought, unquote. In its creative activity, Henri claims that this life enjoys an absolute priority over intentionality. In its absolute priority, the non-objectifying drives of life are said to not only found and initiate the subject's actions, but to engender the norms and standards that orient her engagements with the world. It is the non-objectifying drives of life that engender the criteria by which the subject can immediately evaluate things and assign value to them, that propel her in one direction rather than another, and that inform her as to whether her actions are going well or poorly. In his account of how this done, Henri draws on the work of art theorist and painter, uh, Wassily Kandinsky. The reason for this has to do with the shared ambition that unites their respective projects. Like Henri, Kandinsky's work is guided by its attempt to draw out the value of the inner life of the individual. In the eyes of Henri, Kandinsky's development of abstract art is more than simply a particular movement in painting. What Kandinsky reveals, Henri claims, is that all art, indeed the entire world of life, is abstract, which is to say that in essence, both art and the world stand wholly outside the transcendent visible world and are instead exclusively guided by the acosmic laws of sensibility, by the movement of life and its need for the growth of its feelings and actions. Drawing on Kandinsky, Henri begins by noting that the life of the living subject in its need to increase its ability to feel and act produces, quote, pure pictorial forms, unquote, meaning affective complexes, which have their immediate equivalent in the lines, forms, and colors we encounter in the world. These emotional complexes function as the criteria that determine just how successful and valuable things are, and which therefore guide the subject in her attempts to further her self-experience. Accordingly, objects and events in the world are felt to be valuable to the extent that they resonate with the forces and impressions of life. In the case of a work of art, for example, while there may be several elements that go into the construction of an artwork, the artist's personality, the style, and aesthetic postulates of her time, it is the unconscious movement of affectivity that is principally responsible for determining how the external content should be arranged in order to best capture the inner content in question and for thereby providing the criteria for the success or failure of the artwork as art. In other words, it is life that provides the a priori laws or what Kandinsky refers to as the principles of internal necessity of the artist's self-expression, which should guide the action of the subject in her composition of a work of art. Of course, this process occurs not only in the realm of art, but across the breadth of our experience in the art of, say, logic, ethics, law, architecture, play, and so forth. As we have stated, on reviews, the living subject's experience of art as an exemplar for how the subject essentially experiences all things in general. In his eyes, the unalterable laws that determine our experience of artworks, their quality or value, are also those that determine our experience of the world of life. Abstract art, as Henri says, quote, is not opposed to nature, it discovers nature's true essence, unquote. In keeping with his insistence on the existence of two modes of appearing, that of life and that of the world, Henri views the normative character of life as double in structure. As per the duplicity of appearing, the effective norms that the individual undergoes are translated into a sensible impression. And on the basis of this impression, the individual can form a judgment and come to objectively see this or that as good or bad, etc. There are thus two series of values. First, what originally has value before every act of evaluation and valorization, namely the movement of life. And second, the values that result from that act as the archetypal representation of that from which the act itself proceeds. Henri's radicalization of the life of the subject as a creative movement harbors no less radical 
albeit still largely undeveloped implications for our understanding of the flourishing of the life of the subject. Omri himself explores this matter in his study of culture and barbarism. Okay. Understood in terms of its basis in life, for Henri, culture consists in the practical know-how by which life brings about actions through which it transforms itself and thereby appeases its need for self-growth. Conversely, barbarism consists in the practical know-how by which life negates or otherwise forgets itself. At its most basic level, in keeping with his insistence on the absolute priority of life, Henri acknowledges that the forgetting of life is ontological. The forgetting of life is made possible by, by life's very own ontological structure as an imminent self-appearing that does not admit of any distance or outside in which thus escapes all intuition or thought. It is because the transcendental life that gives the subject to herself and all of her intentional faculties itself functions as an imminent self-feeling, which remains forever refractory to the purview of those faculties, that the subject in her intentional engagements in the world is destined to forget the needs and norms of life that stand at her basis, and instead come to regard her intentional acts and the objectivity they make possible as foundational. The forgetting that transpires on the level of these intentional acts of consciousness stands as an existential or historical level of forgetting. It is this historical forgetting that Henri largely has in mind in his account of what he calls ontological monism. To the extent that the role of life in guiding our engagements in the world is blocked out and diminished, its needs are similarly neglected and the energy that resonates within them is repressed and becomes frustrated even if, as Henri makes clear, it can never be eliminated entirely. However barbarous the life of the individual becomes, it retains a sense for life such that even barbarism is an expression of the latter. However, when life's energy is repressed, the subject's engagement with life and the world undergoes a fundamental shift. In a cultural world in which the living subject's attunement to the needs of life is blocked and its energy goes unused, living subjects grow insensitive, lethargic, neurotic, and ultimately hostile in their dealings with themselves, others, and the world. As such, living subjects no longer create things that resonate with life's need, more or less, and which allow them to grow. And not finding such things or events in the world, they similarly feel alienated from objects and events in the world as a whole. In this mounting detachment and malaise, a desire finally arises within the living subject to destroy life, whether by lashing out violently or by losing uh, oneself in endless distractions in which they, one really no longer does much of anything. Similarly, in keeping with the absolute priority of life over intentionality, Henri claims that the return of the finite self to its basis in life, what he calls a second birth, can only ever be initiated by life itself. As he writes, the possibility which is always open to life to suddenly experience its self-affection as absolute life self-affection is what makes it a becoming. But then when and why is this emotional upheaval produced, which opens a person to his own essence? Nobody knows. The emotional opening of the person to his own essence can only be born of the will of life itself as this rebirth that lets him suddenly experience his, in Homie's eyes, eternal birth. The spirit blows where it wills. In this case, as Frederick Shaler remarks, a heightening of the subject's attunement to life is ultimately, quote, dependent on a favorable moment that would be the equivalent of Keros for radical phenomenology. As Rolf Kuhn notes, there is thus a kind of transcendental reduction at work in Henri. Yet unlike in Husserl, where this reduction is a matter of the subject's freedom, it is here the subject's radical non-freedom or passive suffering of the effective event and will of life's immediate self-revelation that is solely responsible for restoring her attunement to the needs and original know-how of life and for allowing it to flourish. This means that in contrast to Searle, 
phenomenological reflection or engagement with the history of ideas more generally cannot provide the impetus for the radical transformation whereby the subject revives her attunement to life. The initial push that leads the subject back to the basis of her being in the world in life must come from life and not from the freedom of subject. Hence Henri's description of this re reduction as a, a counter reduction. Be that as it may, if we look to Henri's description of how this process actually unfolds, it seems as though this second birth cannot be entirely random or fortuitous. Even if the subject cannot know exactly when or how her attunement to life may be renewed, this does not eliminate the importance of pursuing intentional projects that are conducive to its revitalization and well being. Henri refers to such intentional engagements as higher forms of culture among which he counts art, namely the experience of life through shape and color ethics, experience of life, say, in works of mercy or charity, and religion, experience of life uh, in the words of, of Christ or the reading of scripture in Henri's case. Speaking to the role of Christian ethics in the renewal of life, Henri himself acknowledges that this ethics, quote, explicitly grants action, specifically an action that is the doing of an individual, the power to reestablish him in his original condition and in this way save him, unquote. Thus, even if it is life that serves as the initial impetus to any such rejuvenation of life, it would appear as though such intentional engagements and their corresponding objects possess some manner of causal efficacy on life. In fact, in his first magnum opus, The Essence of Manifestation, Henri acknowledges that it suffices for the phenomenologist to become, quote, conscious of the basic obscurity, which in principle belongs to the essence of life, not for the purpose of surmounting it, it is true, but in order to live it as such in mystery." Unquote. In this passage, Henri advocates for the importance of a type of mindfulness as a preliminary instruction to, or preparation for a rebirth in life. Henri does not expand on this matter at great length, it appears as though such mindfulness consists in a, a fundamental shift in the subject's attitude, in a sort of uh, curious, non-judgmental observing of present feelings and thoughts. Okay? In other words, it consists in a newfound awareness of the limitations of one's intentional consciousness and of the immeasurable nature of the life that undergirds it. In cultivating this mindfulness, the implication is that although by no means enables the living individual to overcome the resistance of life to reflection and thereby control it completely, a mindfulness of this fact can allow us to live this life in its mystery in a healthier way by letting it be. That is by providing the subject with the heightened awareness of the role of both life and consciousness in constituting the world. Mindfulness can potentially help liberate the subject from her previous mental blockages and assumptions, say from her tendency to privilege the rational, willing side of life, and put her in a position to better allow each of life's creative potentials to have a dynamic role in the production of a cultural world that re would resonate with the needs of life and its flourishing. However, if this is the case, then there's a more complex relationship between affectivity and intentionality than Henri's conception of life as a radical self-sustaining imminence can accommodate. For if certain intentional engagements and their corresponding objects make an intensification or deadening of life's feeling, of one's feeling for life more likely, then this indicates that the realm of intentionality enjoys some causal efficacy over life. Yet precisely this Henri's thought cannot accommodate. If as per the duplicity of appearing and the absolute priority of affectivity over intentionality, imminent life unilaterally founds and drives intentionality such that everything that appears within the visible order of the latter is ultimately but an unreal reflection of the subject's lived through experience, then intentionality, it seems, cannot enjoy even a relative autonomy over life. For the realm of intentionality to enjoy any such autonomy, it would be necessary for life to admit of some manner of transcendence or fracture. At the very least, it must be acknowledged, acknowledged that Henri's study of the creativity of life highlights the need for renewed atten attention 
to the types of specific cultural practices that may enrich one's sense of life and way which may nurture the mindfulness that can play an important part in this process and in thereby enabling one to live well. Okay. Though Henri engages in extensive study of the history of psychoanalysis, it is cu perhaps curious that his work does not address that of the Austrian psychoanalyst Otto Rank. This is not only curious, it perhaps speaks to Henri's relative, relatively meager background in the history of psychoanalysis, but also unfortunate given the fact that despite his differences with Henri, Rank stands very much in line with Henri in his insistence on the central role of creativity in the formation of one's personality and in living well, not to mention in laying out an account of mindfulness that is of no small importance in both of these. Rank joins Henri in finding that the original drive inherent to human life is an impulse towards self-preservation and self-growth. Life functions as an impulse that is bent on its own preservation through the production of new affects and values. At the same time, Rank places a, a great deal more emphasis on the dualistic nature of this life drive. On Rank's account, the growth of life is dialectical in nature in that it consists in the subject's need for individuality, meaning separation and self-assertion, and collectivity, meaning union and self-surrender. Consequently, in order to grow and thereby ready oneself and others for the renewal of culture, in contemporary Western society, the subject must find a way to live through the tension that is brought about by these dualities of life. What is more rank, in keeping with his insistence on life's ambiguity, stresses the importance of both the subject's drives and its will and its ability to achieve this end. In his study of the will, rank finds that the will consists in two forms. One that is rational and voluntary, and another that is irrational and involuntary. According to Rank, it is the will of the subject can, that can shape its life drive into a creative drive, which seeks to fulfill the former's need for self-preservation by achieving a personal immortality and glorification for the subject. By doing so, the will contributes to the development of a creative or artistic personality type. The artistic personality is one who accepts herself and thereby utilizes her creative impulse to immortalize her personality by creating art. She creates an ideal that serves to focus her life activity and which enables her to creatively affirm her difference in union with the collective will of her culture by objectifying and immortalizing herself in works of art. Conversely, the will, when it excessively checks the subject's instinct of life, results in a thwarted creativity, or what Rank reviews as a neurotic personality type. Much as barbarism in Henri results from life's thwarted, thwarted creative impulse, so too in Rank, neurosis is a thwarted urge to creativity. For Rank, the neurotic, quote, is a, a failed artist, unquote. While the neurotic, like the artist, is strong-willed, unlike the latter, she is overwhelmed by a fear of life or death meaning a fear of separation or a fear of getting absorbed in the whole and of becoming no one. As a result, the will of the neurotic is wholly used up by trying to deny life, by trying to restrict her own experience by repressing her will and the will of her culture. Whereas the artist strives for immortality through the production of her works, the neurotic naively tries to save and accumulate life as much as possible. Given the emphasis he places on the ambiguous condition of life, I believe Rank's psychology of creativity provides an opportunity to begin to work through Henri's problematic account of the relation between affectivity and intentionality and their role in attuning the subject to her life in the world. More than that though, Rank's existential approach to psychotherapy, which stands in a dynamic mutual relationship with his psychoanalytic theory, provides concrete examples of cultural practices through which living individuals may enrich their sense of life and develop a mindfulness that can play a crucial role in this process. Reich's existential psychotherapy begins with analysis of the neuroses of transference. As Sigmund Freud first observed, human beings in general display a tendency to attach their libido to a particular object, which affords them compensation for some prior trauma in the form of pleasure. 
by talking through the patient's most intimate life events and unconscious feelings, analysts provide ideal circumstances for such libido transference and for thereby revealing the unconscious of the patient in its purest, most concentrated form. And Ranks viewed the, the first libidinal binding and trauma is based on the biological relation to the mother and the separation of the child from its mother and birth. The anxiety experienced in this birth trauma is then repeated in all the subject's subsequent relations. In rousing the anxiety of this primal trauma once more, the analyst allows the patient to experience a veritable second birth that can release her from this central conflict. On the basis of her knowledge of psychoanalytic theory, the analyst can then use this newly unsettled receptive state of the patient to her benefit by endeavoring to help her come to see what she has been repressing in the, in the unconscious. Namely, that she has been reproducing this earlier relation, not only in therapy, but in life in general. Importantly for Rank, this quote, necessary understanding is not gained purely intellectually, but by means of projection, which teaches us to recognize our true self in the mirror of the other, the analyst in this case. Unquote. The learning that transpires here is thus one that is essentially undergone on an emotional level. Following this, a process of re-education ensues. With the freeing of the patient from her mother fixation, the transference with the analyst is transformed into an identification. The patient now identifies with the analyst on an emotional level as a representative of the outside world. As such, the analyst can effectively endeavor to correct the patient's attitude towards her suffering and finally ready her to free herself from the transference relation to the analyst and to reform her ego on her own by redirecting her de desires and feelings to a more healthy object or ideal. As illustrated here, Rank's therapeutic method itself performs something of a counter reduction. By rousing the patient's repressed conflicts and allowing her to repeat her primal suffering, this existential psychotherapy removes the conditions in which the patient's symptoms have their origin and thereby begins to lead her back to her true self, to the self she might be if she could learn to accept herself and to bear her suffering in a more healthy way. Rank psychotherapy does not therefore seek to abolish the source of the subject's illness, namely her emotional life, but to assist the patient in affirming its role in her life and to provide it with access to suitable means for its expression. An important element in this process on Rank's account involves instilling in the patient a mindfulness of her true self and her creative abilities. Rank's existential psychotherapy provides the individual with a heightened, non-judgmental, curious awareness of her feelings and thoughts and of her own responsibility for shaping them. This provides her with an opportunity to reconsider her deeply sedimented habits and to understand that her own habits, as well as those of her tradition and time, are not the only or even perhaps the best ways of dealing with and knowing the world, and that she might, for the sake of her own well-being, reconfigure her personality around a new ideal. In so doing, the subject simultaneously develops a mindfulness of the role of her instinctive life and of her will in allowing her to creatively reconfigure her ego. On Rank's account, this involves becoming aware of the fact that, as important as one's deliberate willing is in one's creative pursuits, the instincts and involuntary will play a no less crucial role. It involves recognizing that there is both a creative, uh, pardon me, a deliberate creativity and a spontaneous creativity at play in one's life, and that a truly healthy creative personality necessarily allows both their place. In these ways, the mindfulness wrought by Rank's th therapeutic method can play an important role in the development of a creative state that the late Austrian regards as integral to healthy personality formation. Among those means whose usefulness in nurturing the patient's creative abilities that Rank emphasizes is that of art. Rank's work may thus be seen as laying at least some of the groundwork for art therapy and for the use of a variety of artistic methods such as painting, music, and collage as ways of nurturing self-awareness and self-esteem. Another such means that Rank might have drawn upon had he the chance is that of phenomenology, specifically Henri's material phenomenology, which, as we can perhaps now better see, 
is something of a kindred spirit to his own project. With its study of the nature of the creativity of the self and its relation to the world, Henri's material phenomenology can assist both analyst and Alessand in a suspending their unquestioned assumptions about the nature of creativity and selfhood and in developing a clearer and deeper understanding of these matters. This can as assist analysts in better opening up to their patients in the transference process, which is of the utmost importance in accessing the latter's unconsciousness in its most naked form and can further help them understand the patient's primal conflict. On the other hand, engagement with material phenomenology can similarly assist the patient's second birth. It can contribute to the re-education of the patient's feelings and thoughts through the production of art or whatever else might be appropriate uh, to the patient. And it can help ready her to terminate the transference process. Similarly, psychotherapy can provide the analyst and the phenomenologist with findings that may require her to alter her psychoanalytic theory and phenomenological descriptions of these matters. There is thus not only a dynamic mutual relationship between material phenomenology and ranks like psychoanalytic theory and existential psychotherapy, but a productive one, one which can be utilized to assist in developing the creativity and mindfulness that can contribute to the well being of the individual and that of society as a whole. Okay, that's it, that's it for me. Okay, so we have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions. <coughs> Yes, heavy. Um, if you don't mind, can you please type my question there as well? Because I, I just can't. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have a question for you. Um, thank you very much for your speaker. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I was thinking that you're right, um, that uh, there is clinical evidence for the therapeutic value of art in art, that is art therapy, for instance, and the same, the same case for mindfulness. So, yes, I, I think it's a great idea to do this. Now, I was wondering whether. And also, I mean, I've seen the other thing as well that in the East they do calligraphy as an act of communication. Uh, and uh, I was thinking that this is very true when. Right? However, is it the same thing when somebody observes? So should we not distinguish between the cognitive kind of uh, abilities or skills when we make art and when we observe a piece of art? And when well and, and also when we see art, do we mean just visual art? Or do we mean kind of more artistic or um, yes, so, yes, so that's question whether you think we practice mindfulness the same way when we make art and when we observe things. Yeah, no, I think that's really good questions, good points. Um, because I suppose I came to this place from a place that I'm an artist and I am mainly a painter. So I know firsthand that when I'm painting, I go into a commercial place without any effort, I don't have to try. So um, I did have to do a bit more research and look into the idea of the audience going into a mindful place. I do believe, um, and I think Dufresne comes from the point uh, a lot of the time uh, uh, from the observer and the viewer. And he does talk about um, putting in the effort to appreciate a painting or a work of art, um, treating it like a task, focusing on it. So I think that there is that there is a good argument to say that the audience and the viewer can also avail of the same as well viewing art. 
And I also know this from being an art lover myself, not just painting myself, but going <laughs> to other people's exhibitions, looking at art, that you can, if you, you know, if you put in, as Dufresne says, the, the correct effort, um, you know, he's very prescriptive about it. It takes, seems to take the romance out of it a little bit, but um, I do think that we often uh, view artworks very quickly. Um, we might rush through a museum or rush through an exhibition, and we're not really taking the time to view them mindfully, but if we do, I think that it can bring you to um, that sort of a place as well, you know, a, a place of mindfulness. It's just, it is a different experience. Um, your other point, which is a very good one as well, um, obviously interactive art where people can participate in installations, they're more, again, it's not as difficult to get into the mindful state when you're doing that because you are getting into the artwork. So it's almost like the way I've described when I'm painting, the, the state that I would go into. Of course, if you're, you're in a, participatory um, installation, you, you might go into that stage. But I, that isn't actually what I'm talking about because I'm, I'm talking primarily about painting just, just for the purposes of, of this paper. But I do think there's a lot more to be said about it. There's a lot more to be said about lots of other types of art, about the aesthetic experience. I mean, it's such a massive area. And I think that the idea of, of participating in art is like it's a whole other paper that would be really interesting. And I think it would be easier to argue that that brings you into the mindful state than observation. I think it maybe takes a bit more effort to argue that viewing art is 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 analogous with mindfulness as participating. So, yeah, there, there is also I think um, in different traditions that they, they use um, um, in the east kind of mantras. They, they use kind of some visual ads as well. Yeah. For meditations. Yeah, and sound sound art sound. Is, is also you know very valid. And as you say with the Sumier, the Japanese um, ink drawings and splashed ink drawings, like they would unashamedly say that that is for the purposes of mindful mindfulness. You know, they they don't separate that from art. We don't seem to look at it so much like that in the West, but I feel like that as an artist. I, I mean, I definitely feel it is the most effortlessly mindful space to get into is when you're making art. Uh, Mahon O'Brien? It's a kind of a follow on in, in a way, Holly, if you don't mind. And, and if, if this derails the, the, the question of the question, thing, I'm just curious what you make of Merleau Ponty's remarks about photography in life. And it's quite pejorative in that very photograph. Um, and I mean, I'm, I, so I'll put my cards up there. Like, he's completely wrong. In terms of the way he sort of says that a, a anatomically completely incorrect painting of a derby horse is, is much more accurate than the, than the photograph. And there's a sense in which a lot of what he has to say um, in that essay holds without making that claim anyway. So I'm just curious, especially insofar as you're painting, what do you think about his remarks about photography, or do you buy them? No, I, I tend to agree with you, um, because I, I think that he's he's trying to distance himself almost from anything that might be technological, and he's, he's because he also is very pejorative about representational art, which I don't agree with. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't agree because I think that if you're, if you're a photographer and you're taking photographs, that you have to get into that same sort of a phenomenological state to focus and to choose your subject matter and to, to get your composition and that you're using the same cognitive skills in many ways. Maybe not the same physical um, gross motor skills that you would with the, with the environment of painting. So I, I would accept that um, that difference that with painting it's you're, you're using much more embodiment is much more involved and your gross motor skills. But as far as the phenomenological state and a mindful state, I, I would disagree with him on the photography. Max made a comment in the um, he kite uh, comment. He says, thanks for that. I believe mindfulness can help the individual ensure the results of her analysis are not lost. Uh, the moment her analysis ends, then that she does not repeat her symptoms. Uh, any other questions? Could I ask a question tonight? Yeah, of course. Um, 
Yeah, I was just wondering if he had any thoughts on um, Adolf Hitler was actually a failed artist. Um, you know, and I've and I've often wondered about this myself because he was he was quite a good artist, but because he was failed because he couldn't obviously get into university or get into their level with it. And I just wondered if, if he'd ever if he had any thoughts on the mind of Adolf Hitler and the whole connection to art, or you know, anything if he's, if he's ever considered that in the context of his paper. Did did I myself or did the did Rank himself ever touch upon no, or Rank either? Either or. Yeah, uh, not to my not rank himself, I don't believe ever did touch upon his particular case. Um, you were mentioning that him he he was something of a, a failed artist or, or what have yes, you. Yes, because well, because he he applied for art college before he went off to do everything else that he did, and he he didn't get it, he couldn't get in. But he he was quite a good artist, but he was a failed artist. And just in the on, in the context of your paper, I wonder mm -hmm. what a sort of neurosis maybe this brought up in him that was unaddressed. And and I don't know if you're familiar with his background. I just maybe thought maybe if you had been, you might no, have not terribly. No, I can say in the in the case of Rank, as I mentioned, he tends to view neurosis as arising either from a fear of life, meaning a fear of you know individuation of, of separation or of, of sort of losing oneself, getting lost in the whole, right? Becoming no one in that sense, that sense. So denying in some sense, this maybe dialectical movement of life, that life, this ambiguity of life, that life involves both a, a drive to separate and assert oneself. And yet also it, it involves a drive for something, not just self-preservation, but uh, for something beyond oneself, right? For some collectivity, be it a faith, you know, a cause, uh, maybe a vocation of some sort, something beyond oneself. Uh, and it, it results essentially, neurosis in his view doesn't result from, you know, a, a weakness of will, but they're actually very strong-willed individuals, much like an artist, but uh, uh, out of, you know, uh, maybe a fear, a life fear of a death fear, they they are unable to uh, use that will in, in a sort of a creative way, right, by allowing them to, to release that, that uh, energy or what have you. Uh, and instead, it sort of turns against oneself in, in the form of neuroses by constantly trying to deny one's will and deny that of the, the culture or one's religion of the time. Uh, the will of the culture, the will of maybe certain dominant traditions. Uh, you could so you could use that maybe psychoanalytic theory as an attempt to maybe diagnose cases such as his own, perhaps, or an, an other artist, other artists who maybe maybe create something at one point, but then subsequently struggle to produce anything once again. Uh, so you can maybe it's a useful tool in interpreting. Uh, certain people's productive actions or, or lack thereof. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Emmy. Yeah, um, I have a question for Max. Um, Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I didn't get that right. So I'll put this in advance. I'm making it wrong. But I I got the impression that you said that mindfulness is there is a creative element in mindfulness, right? Yes, essentially that mindfulness understood as some sort of maybe curious, open, non-judgmental awareness of present feelings and thoughts can, as it were, help maybe free up or liberate one's creative abilities. So it's a state of mind that is conducive to the liberation of one's maybe creative potential. Okay, okay, that, that, that's a good point, all right, yeah. Yeah, because, because well, what I, I was thinking that, that that makes more sense because, uh, mindfulness is all about clearing emptying the mind right while being creative is more about finding links right so it's something more than that so mindfulness is supposed to be about the simplicity of the present moment 
while the creativity is almost very on the other side. But but if you say that mindfulness helps to kind of to prepare the space for creativity, yes, that, mm -hmm. that, that makes yes. sense. Yeah, a state of mind that it can be can maybe contribute to making possible uh, a creative uh, way of life, if you like, right? Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> thank you, it's for Max. Um, I was very interested in your discussion of Henri on the nature of life. Some of it sounds very Bergsonian. I don't know if, if Henri himself was influenced by Bergson, but there's a sense in which there's a certain, you, you use the word, bar actually Henri uses the word barbarism um, in a sort of exaggerated way maybe, but there's a sense in which the the basic flow of living, you know, the, the what Bergson calls the elan vital or the life force, you know, it's something that uh, is not amenable to control at all. It's just flowing through it, you know. Mm. Um, and and uh, there's a lot of that in this notion of auto affection in uh, Henri. So I just wanted you to hear a little bit how you. How you rise above that you talked about judgment and so on but how only gets beyond this immersion in the uh in the, the flow of life the da hin labor this heidegger calls it mm -hmm. yes I, I i'll begin by just mentioning i think my the my computer there was an audio issue during the first part of what you're saying but i believe i caught the majority of, of what you were were you getting at? Uh, in, in Henri, his own work, I believe there is there's something of an unresolved tension in his, his account of the matter. It's oftentimes, in, in my interpretation, it seems as though some of the conclusions he draws aren't always consistent with his own an analysis of the matter. Henri, very much as I indicated, uh, does contend that life itself is uh, absolute self-contained entity and that enjoys a you know an uh, absolute priority over uh intentional faculties right that it's life that sort of unilaterally directs uh the subject and all of her actions uh, however at the same time he seems to want to give some indication that intentional acts can serve as sort of preliminary, uh, maybe preparation that for, at, in this case, a rebirth, that they that, that are intentional acts, such as engaging in, you know, high works of culture, engaging with artworks, engaging in acts of charity, uh, with uh, reading of religious texts, that these intentional actions play uh, something of a, an essential role in all of the transformations that life can undergo. But it's, on my view, it's not clear whether his own theory of life can really allow that. And I'm not sure if, if he can really accommodate uh, providing intentionality with really any essential, maybe causal efficacy or any real power over life. So in that sense, and in, in to, to make that possible, it seems you would have to modify his theory of life to admit that life perhaps isn't radically imminent without any distance or outside, but that life must involve some manner of transcendence. Right? Uh, it can still be a power uh, to, that gives itself to itself, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be radically imminent. And that uh, perhaps in, in the work of others, such as maybe Rank himself, there's more of an acknowledgement of the complex, more nuanced relation between affectivity and intentionality, and that there can be both a deliberate willing, which is voluntary, involves conscious, rational effort, but then there is perhaps uh, an unself-conscious, more passive uh, willing, which is perhaps ir irrational and which ultimately can't be controlled uh, 
entirely by the deliberate will. And that there's maybe certain, it's important to allow this uh, not involuntary willing to have a, a dynamic role in, in one's life, in one's, the way in which one lives in general, right? Otherwise it can lead to neuroses within the individual. And Rank postulates it can also be the cause of, you know, maybe a totalitarian state on a societal level, right? A, a culture which views, you know, the rational, deliberate willing as what's most appropriate to each and every action. Maybe there are certain actions where this more involuntary, spontaneous organizational activity of the involuntary will would be more appropriate, right? And there needs to be maybe a... Uh, that's actually very helpful. Thank you. Uh, actually, okay. very considered. All right. Thank um, you. Because people like Heidegger, of course, especially being in time, put a strong emphasis on decisiveness and having making decisions, you know, about going with the flow, you know, deciding to get involved in repetition or breaking with it. And Husserl, it's really central to Husserl, has the notion of stance taking. You know, Stellungnahme, where we can, for example, have a, a drive to smoke. When you maybe don't like this drive to smoke, you give into it, but you don't like giving into it. And so there's always a stance taking, even towards uh, affectivity. Uh, and for, for Husserl, that can be go at higher and higher levels to until we get purely reflective, rationally driven motives, dominating desires. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And I could see how that becomes true as one ages, right? The, uh, during one's earlier stages, perhaps you're more, there's an immediacy and a certain powerfulness to these maybe non objectifying drives. But then ideally, as one goes along, one can achieve maybe a certain reflective distance and just decide to take a, a position or stance on some of one's instincts or drives or what have you without perhaps being able to control them uh, entirely. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> person in the chat is, sounds like they're asking you to elaborate on the Ah, Pierre, yes. Pierre says, uh, sorry. Thank you both for your talks. For Max Schaeffer, I missed part of the talk, so I apologize if this was answered, but can mindfulness be practiced in a way that is purely immanent? It seems that there is a need for an intentional distance to an object of contemplation. Uh, yes, no, thank you for that question. Uh, yes. Um, as, as I mentioned in, in the course of, of my talk, uh, mindfulness, I think even in, in Henri, would in fact have to be an intentional activity. Uh, uh, so, so I would agree uh, with, with the, the account you, you've provided there. Uh, it may have its, its sort of basis or in, inspiration within some sort of uh, effective movement, but yeah, I believe mindfulness would necessarily involve uh, uh, intentionality. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, we can uh, thank the two speakers. Um, thank you very much for the uh, uh, And uh, now it's where's Jim? Okay. Uh, we we huh? We will resume in. Uh, there's a coffee break now, and we'll resume in uh, half an hour uh, for uh, Jim Morley's uh, talk. So while in the program, it says that we resume at uh, four thirty. I think we start at 4.20, uh, so because there's no reason to have a longer break. Uh, so 4.20, half an hour from now, uh, we'll have Jim Morley give his, uh, the, the final talk of the day.
Ναι. Να βάλω εγώ το πατέρα μου. Ναι. 